riddle me this, Batman. If you are justice, how long does it last? For what is the price of one Baja Blast? You're gonna have to take me seriously like this for the rest of the video. I still love the Batman. In the era of cinematic universes and streaming services, as well as so many other truly fantastic films this past year, the Batman has continued to dominate discussion as one of, if not the, best movies of the year, and ranks high for many people as one of the best superhero movies ever made. And to me, that's the mark of a truly great film and a truly great piece of art. With more news coming out about the different spin-off shows and everything else Matt Reeves is involved in, I've recently been thinking more about the sheer potential that the movie left off on and all the different directions that the still unconfirmed sequel could go in. Back in March, I made a big pitch about what I would want to see from the Batman 2. I still like a lot of that video, but there's just so much possibility with the way the first movie ended in this universe, and with the size of Batman's rogues gallery, it didn't feel fair to stop there. This isn't a part two to that video or anything, instead just some other possible directions that the movie could go in. Batman has perhaps the greatest cast of villains of any comic book character, with stories that have defined generations, and I want to explore some of the reasons why they're so great using the fantastic world of the first movie set up. And so, here are my pitches for different villains that I would want to see in the Batman Batman universe. Can you read this screen behind me? I'm worried you can't. It says there's something in the way again, and I think that's a very funny joke. In that first video, I named the movie Silence of the Batman after the villain Hush. And I still think it would be fun if instead of just doing the Batman 2 or a subtitle, we do what Reeves did with the Planet of the Apes movies and have different prefixes for each movie. And so my first pitch is for a movie that I would call Heart of the Batman. We open in a Gotham apartment as a pair of GCPD officers investigate a disturbance. A man sits in a chair, unable to move. A large gash runs across his torso, which has been loosely stitched up. One of his kidneys has been removed and stolen. The only thing keeping him alive is the thick layer of ice and frozen flesh that covers his entire body. Mr. Freeze, baby! Victor Freeze is a character that absolutely deserves a live action adaptation that does him justice. He's someone with so much pain and anguish and is such a different story from a lot of other Batman rogues by having this tragic and understandable motivation behind what he does. He isn't one of the crazies, he's just a man doing whatever it takes to save the life of the only person he loves. Except for the times when he wasn't and we don't talk about that. And I think we could take this character who in most other media is after things like tech or diamonds and instead make him into something horrifying. It is spooktober after all. The opening monologue from the first movie during Halloween will forever be ingrained into my mind. And so many of Batman's best villains when you take a step back and look at them are fucking terrifying. Most of them could fill up a 90s slasher movie franchise all on their own. Serial killers, a giant bat monster, a homicidal clown, a walking scarecrow that makes you live your greatest nightmare, a guy that tells riddles. For fun? Most people know Matt Reeves from his work on the Planet of the Apes movies, but like a lot of directors, he's not afraid to delve into horror. His directorial debut was part of this anthology horror movie from the 90s that's honestly better than it has any right to be for his first project when he was that young. And his first big thing outside of TV was Cloverfield, which stands out in the massive sea that is found footage horror. I just watched Let Me In from 2010, which is the American remake of the fantastic Swedish movie Let the Right One In, and I absolutely loved it. Just like The Batman, the movie was directed by Matt Reeves, with cinematography by Greg Frazier, and composed by Michael Giacchino. And there are a lot of scenes in it that are super similar to scenes from the Batman, and I would love to see Reeves bring more of that into future installments. Look, there's even a body that gets found in a block of ice. Mr. Freeze is perfect for this. There's also just a lot of room for the aesthetics of it all. We can set the movie during Christmas time in the snow to contrast the rainy Halloween setting of the first one. And because so much of Gotham is flooded, it'd be such a waste to not have that portion of the city freeze over into solid ice. I was gonna throw out some fan casting ideas, but that never tends to age well in this video, so let me know down below if some actors you would want to see play Mr. Freeze or any of the villains I talk about today, because I gotta get engagement. Through these characters, we can tell a story about desperation. The animated series episode Heart of Ice and the movie Sub-Zero are some of the best pieces of Batman media out there, and I think combining those two stories would be the best way to adapt the tragedy that is Mr. Freeze's character. We can tie his origin to Gotham seawalls exploding by having the flood mess with his cryogenic research, causing an accident with his wife Nora, and forcing him to wear a cold suit in order to maintain a survivable body temperature. We establish that with Nora's sickness, her body's starting to fail faster and faster, and Mr. Freeze is stealing internal organs from suitable donors in order to keep her alive. He doesn't kill his victims, he keeps them conscious while he performs the operation by freezing them with a modified liquid nitrogen to numb the pain. This can let us keep the detective atmosphere and tone that was so great about the last one, but without making it another serial killer again. Is it dark? Yes. But so is turning this guy into the fucking Zodiac Killer and putting a cell phone in somebody's chest. I think we're past being scared of making these movies dark. I think there's also potential to tell a story about Bruce understanding more flaws in the system that he benefits from. It was one of my favorite aspects of the first movie, and I think it could be applied a ton to different possible situations. Maybe the selection of healthcare providers in Gotham is incredibly limited, and the coverage is terrible for everyone there, including Victor and Nora, which is part of what sparks this mission. 
And one of Bruce's arcs in the movie is seeing how broken and flawed that system is and trying to fix it. The movie could end similar to how Sub-Zero did, with Bruce putting his money where his mouth is and using his resources to actually cure Nora, making a free and universal healthcare for the people of Gotham in an effort to help make sure that nobody has to suffer the same pain as Victor and Nora. And Victor, with Nora cured and the world assuming he's dead, is able to retire into the Arctic in peace. Freeze is a character that's really hard to make work in the long term without begging the question, why doesn't Bruce just help cure Nora instead of fighting Mr. Freeze? He should use his money on infrastructure instead of just beating. And so I would want to give him that closure and wrap up his character arc in this one story. Before we move on to the next pitch, this video is brought to you by HelloFresh, a food delivery service that makes cooking meals at home as easy as possible. I've never really considered myself that much of a cook, but I've started making this one pan baked tortellini from HelloFresh and the directions are super easy to understand. The whole process takes less than 30 minutes and since the ingredients are all portioned out already, everything is super easy, especially the cleanup. HelloFresh delivers fresh, quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week. They offer veggie, pescatarian, and fit and wholesome meals to make it easy to stick to your goals. And if you're concerned with waste, HelloFresh cuts down on your food waste by at least 23% compared to grocery shopping. Use my link or go to HelloFresh.com and use code POGHF7488 for 65% off plus free shipping on your first box. Once you click, my description will live update to count up the purchases, and thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. The next pitch is for a movie that I call Face of the Batman. We open in an actor's trailer as a man sits in front of a mirror. A voice calls out from outside, calling him to set. The man calls back, saying that he'll be ready in a second as he uses his hands and molds his face into shape, like if it was made of clay. Now, Reeves recently said he was working on a project featuring the Clayface character, as well as a few others that I'll get to in a bit, and that really excites me. It's not clear if it's for the sequel, a spin-off movie, or one of the series that he's working on, but either way, I think there's a ton of potential for the character to exist in Reeves' universe. You might say that Clayface is too outlandish of a villain to use in the grounded reality that was set up in the first movie, and I think that might be true, but at the same time, I think it's incredibly limiting to try and constantly fit Batman's fantastic rogues gallery into what could be called realistic. There are countless different villains with crazy different powers and abilities that to always want to fit within the box of grounded reality is going to lead to some compromises that just aren't fun for anybody. It's how he ended up with this Bane and a Rachel ghoul that's killed in the first movie. Realism should be a way to bolster the concepts as they exist, not to put those ideas and characters into a box. We had that for seven years with the Dark Knight trilogy, and I think it's time that we tapped into the more comic book side of things. And there's a story that can be told with that too. The scene with the Joker from the first movie, while being my least favorite part of that film, still had a purpose. It was showcasing the birth of the supervillain, that the villains are changing from just killing and crime bosses into something more. How does this version of Batman react to that? A Batman who's accustomed to the rules of his world, to the science and the logic, forced to face the truth that his reality doesn't make as much sense as he wishes it did. That he's gonna have to step up and fight a monster made of giant clay or a woman that can control plants with her mind and not just a masked serial killer with 500 Twitter followers. It's why if they wanted to bring in a version of Superman into this universe, I wouldn't be instantly opposed to it. There's story and character work in that kind of world change and I think it could be fun to explore. I think that a way to do Clayface would be to do the same thing that the animated series did with the two-parter episode Feet of Clay. The first half of the story had Clayface more akin to his Golden Age counterpart, Basil Carlo, a criminal who used a chemical to mold and change his face before he became too addicted to the substance and was turned into the clay monster people are more familiar with. If we're really worried about the realism angle, building to that throughout the movie with the transformation happening at the midpoint would be a way to still make it work. Whether or not we want to do Basil Carlo or Matt Hagen or Ethan Bennett or any of the other people that have been Clayface over the years is really up to personal preference, but I think the story of an actor whose face becomes disfigured and thus becomes addicted to this experimental substance manipulated by the mob to carry out their crime will be a perfect addition to Reeves' universe. Especially if we take from the animated series and have the story be about Clayface impersonating Bruce Wayne. This would be a story about addiction, both with Clayface's addiction to the chemical that changes his face, but also Bruce's addiction to the Batman persona. It was touched on a little bit in the first movie, but I think we can further explore it here. Like in Feet of Clay, Bruce is too deep into being Batman to realize that he's even being framed for a crime, and even worse, because he spends so little time as Bruce Wayne, Maybe Dory, the housekeeper from the first movie, is attacked by Clayface and she truly believes it's Bruce because of how little she knows about him. And it's part of Bruce's arc to step more into the light not only as Batman, but also as Bruce Wayne. And I think a story like this is the perfect time to introduce Dick Grayson to this universe. There's a really big rush from fans to introduce Robin in this next movie, and believe me, I totally get it. Dick Grayson is one of my favorite comic characters ever, and I think he and his relationship with Bruce needs to be adapted properly on screen. Robin as a character brings out the best in Bruce, and the only times we've gotten to see it in live action are... Oh. Oh. Oh no. Oh no. 
Batman Forever is good and you cannot change my mind. But I don't want to jump headfirst into that and just throw Robin into the franchise in between movies. The thought of this guy, this guy, adopting a child is a pretty wild concept on its own. And I think there's a story to be told and how that broken and flawed man comes to terms with the idea that he needs help and he needs a family. So we introduce Dick in this movie, his parents are killed, and he's taken into the Wayne household not by Bruce, but instead by Alfred, who claims he knows what's best for Bruce. Because he does because he's Alfred. And it's Bruce's arc in this movie to break his addiction and be Bruce Wayne again, not only for himself, but also to help this young boy who's in the same position he was in. We don't do Robin, we don't do any suits or training. Bruce just steps up and accepts that this boy's future is now in his hands, and the movie ends with him revealing the Batcave to Dick before we cut to black and save that story for the third movie. The next pitch is for a movie that I call Mind of the Batman. We open in a psychiatrist's office as a patient is being brought in. He's a troubled man, his body covered in scars after he's killed dozens of innocent people. The doctor sits in a chair, cloaked in shadow, and begins to talk to the man. He asks him the standard questions about his past, about why he acts out in such violence like this, about who he thinks made him this way. The man is confused. He says maybe it was his childhood or his parents, but the doctor stops him. Dr. Hugo Strange leans forward in his chair. No, it was the Batman. Hugo Strange has always been a super interesting villain for me. I think that an evil psychiatrist using his position of power to manipulate his patients in this twisted quest to prove he's better than Batman has so much potential, and I'm frankly surprised we haven't seen him in a live action movie before. A big part of the first movie was how the concept and idolization of Batman was the inspiration for Riddler to go on this murder spree, which is what led to Bruce realizing the flaws in how he was doing things. And I think we can lean into that idea and explore it further by using Doctor Strange. Wait, hang on, wrong one. And I think because he's so different from your traditional Batman villain, we can do something more elaborate with the plot and really make it stand out from the first movie. After the last district attorney was killed, we meet his replacement, Harvey Dent. I don't want to rehash too much of what we've seen in other movies, but I think if this is going to be a long running series, there's a lot of potential to use the Harvey Dent character and have the audience witness that tragedy in full as opposed to just doing it in one movie. We don't do Two-Face until hypothetical movie four or five, really flesh out the relationship that Batman and Harvey have. We the audience know what's coming and we know we can't stop it and that makes it all the more tragic. Harvey Dent is the new guy in the block, one of the few people in the justice system who actually wants to help make Gotham a better place, but he doesn't agree with the Batman. Sure, he's doing better in the time since the first movie, but Dent still believes things should be done by the books without a masked vigilante loose cannon. Who's to say that Batman isn't the reason that so many of these supervillains are coming out of the woodworks? One night, Batman and Harvey are taken by surprise and knocked unconscious. They both wake up, locked in a cell and handcuffed together in Arkham Asylum. The trapped in Arkham storyline isn't anything new. We had it in the video game, we had it in the comics, it was the original idea for Mask of the Phantasm, and most recently it was going to be the plot of the Batfleck movie, and maybe still could be? Who, I, who, who knows? I don't know. Basically, my point is that this shit isn't original and I am a garbage, pretentious hack. But I think it'd be really fun to take the story that we know so well from other media, have Hugo Strange masterminding the entire thing, and force a character like Harvey Dent, who fundamentally doesn't agree with Batman, alongside him. On top of that, I think the perfect third act would be an adaptation of The Trial from the animated series. Harvey is forced to defend the actions of Batman in a messed up and distorted court of law, with Hugo Strange acting as the judge to prove that Batman creates his villains. Throughout the movie, we see Strange as having sessions with someone he's paying special attention to, putting in personal time and care into this project of his. A project to prove that he's better than the Batman. To cure a monster. During the trial, Strange brings out this patient as a surprise and key witness. Batman looks in horror as the man approaches the bench. He looks different, but he would recognize him anywhere. His teeth are fixed, his hair is combed, his scars are healed. The Joker. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes. I'm sick of the Joker. I said it in the first video and God damn it, I will stand by that until the day I die. At this point, he is just such an overused villain and there are so many other Batman rogues that have more going for them, but I'm not gonna sit here in this Baja Blast costume and pretend like I have no interest at all in what Reeves has set up with the character. This Joker's face is completely disfigured, not from an acid tank, but seemingly from birth. His relationship with Batman is slowly developing over time and he's clearly a violent person, but he doesn't seem like the maniac that we know Joker to be. So no, I don't want to see Joker be the main villain in any of these movies. But I do think there's a lot of possibility in his existence in the story and the ideas that he brings with them. This can be a story about what makes a monster and how much something like the Batman has anything to do with it. Strange wants so bad to cure the monster and Joker, but the treatments are manipulative, violent, and abusive, turning him even more into one. It's a way to do the Joker origin that's less about one bad day or we live in a society, and more about specific abuse from things like the prison industrial complex and the broken system that is mental health resources. A movie like this could also tie into whatever they end up doing with the Arkham show if that ends up happening, letting us expand this world and the rogues without needing to dedicate an entire movie for each of them. Before 
before we get to the final pitch, here are some honorable mentions. And by honorable mentions, I mean villains that I wanted to include because I like them, but I couldn't think of a pitch for them in time. And the first one is Scarecrow. This one isn't obvious when talking about horror style villains and is another one Matt Reeves recently confirmed he would include in his universe in one way or another. The Nolan movies didn't use the character to his fullest potential in my opinion, but Killian Murphy was great in the role and I can't wait to see how Matt adapts Jonathan Crane. I think it might be interesting if in addition to leaning into the ah, so scary part of fear that we know from the character so well, we also dive into the more subtle elements of fear. Paranoia, anxiety, the sound that you hear when you're home alone at night. Maybe Crane's whole goal is to conduct a science experiment, making a commentary and a parallel on the real life nightmare that was the Tuskegee experiments. Crane targets one specific community in Gotham for this fucked up science project, slowly dosing them more and more to see how they behave with rising levels of fear toxin and recording the ways that they turn on each other until Batman's able to put a stop to it. The next honorable mention is Professor Pig, another character that Matt confirmed to be working on. I think Pig is a really fun character that's getting kind of a big spotlight as of late. He used to be pretty obscure, but now he's popping up everywhere, and I think that's fun. It'd be nice to differentiate him from the other masked killer villains a bit and make him more of a pathetic person. A lonely man-child, desperate for attention and seeking it out through violence. Oh wait, that's how real serial killers are. And the last honorable mention is Killer Moth. Let me tell you, I would do anything for a Killer Moth movie. If Matt Reeves walked up to me on the street, handed me a loaded gun and a list of names, and said he'd promise me a Killer Moth movie if I took care of things for him, I can't promise I'd say no right away. I'd still say no, of course, I'd have to, but for a moment, for a second, I'd consider it. And that scares me. That's how much I need Killer Moth in a movie. Or Dracula. Dracula would be pretty cool too. And now my final pitch is for a movie that I call Flight of the Batman. We open in Gotham on Halloween night. A family ducks into an alley before being surrounded by a group of gang members. The criminals harass the family before we see a shadowy figure standing on a rooftop. Instantly they recognize the Batman, but something's different. They all begin to scatter and run away, except for one. The remaining thug calls out to the bat taunting him. He says that he knows his reputation, and that he's not scared of him. He acts all tough, maybe might break a few bones, but it's not like he's gonna kill him. The bat drops down from the shadowy rooftops above into the light. This is not the Batman. A horrifying monster with deadly claws and razor sharp teeth, and massive wings that span more than 10 feet. The criminal screams in horror as the monster tears into his flesh, ripping him limb from limb. The creature flies away into the night, leaving nothing more than a bloody, desolated corpse. That's right, it's motherfucking Man Bat. All of the other pitches I wanted to lead into horror, but for this villain especially, I want Reeves to go all in on the tone, full on creature feature. I want Man Bat to be as gory and violent as you can possibly get in a PG-13 Batman movie. Really show us, the audience, what it's like to fear a horrifying creature of the night. You might think that Man Bat as a villain isn't able to challenge Bruce mentally and emotionally in the same ways that the Riddler or Mr. Freeze or Hugo Strange can. And while that's true in other media, with Man Bat usually portrayed as just a big monster to fight, I think there's opportunity to take some liberties with the character and use it as a representation for everything Bruce never wants to become. Matt Reeves has made it no secret that the first movie was inspired heavily by Batman Ego, which is a story about the two halves of Bruce's psyche fighting over each other. A moment that's always stood out to me in that book is when the Bat offers Bruce to split the persona in two permanently, allowing that dark part of his mind to take over fully when under the mask and kill criminals to truly spread fear and fight this war. Of course, the entirety of that concept in that book is super surreal and might not be able to work in live action, but I think we can use the character of Man Bat to represent the same idea and the same internal conflict. That can allow this creature feature monster movie to grow into more of a psychological and moral dilemma for the characters. Throughout the movie, we see that this bat creature is killing criminals at night, spreading fear throughout Gotham's underworld better than Batman ever could. We, the audience, know that the killings are completely random, but the rest of Gotham thinks it's the Batman. People begin to fear Batman again, almost completely destroying everything that he's built up as a symbol of hope since the ending of the first movie. We also see that there's a disturbing number of the public and the police that support it. Because of this, Bruce begins to call into question whether or not he should be doing the same. And we can bring Selina back into the picture to try and pull him onto that path. Of course, with a flooded Gotham, there's a ton of room to focus on emphasis on the skies above the city. In my first pitch, I had the Gotham elites and the police use blimps to escape the flooding, which is something I would want to keep, but I also think it'd be great to see Man Bat force Bruce to take to the skies as well. At first, building a bat wing to monitor the city and hunt the monster, and then also upgrading his glider tech into his cape so that he can maneuver enough to fight it. Bruce realizes that the Man Bat is someone that's transforming 
from a human because of the schedule and locations of the killings. This is a lot more outlandish than we got in the first movie, but just like Clayface, I think there's room to have that outlandishness play a part in Bruce's story. I guess you could say that this movie won't be as grounded as the first one. Bruce's lead suspect is a man named Kirk Langstrom, a scientist who's experimenting with bats and echolocation in an effort to cure deafness. His wife Francine was born deaf and he'll stop at nothing until he's able to find a cure. We see that something is suspicious about Langstrom, but we're not sure what. I mean, he's a creepy little dude with an obsession with bats. What could possibly be wrong with that? Everything culminates in the final act when Bruce is able to capture Man Bat and is given a chance to kill the monster. For a moment, he contemplates it and thinks about all the lives it would save, but stops himself, terrified that the thought even crossed his mind. He knows that if he does it, he's no better than the monster that's in front of him. Bruce and Alfred run a test on Man Bat's DNA and cross-reference it with Kirk Langstrom, but didn't get a match. But it did match with someone else. The Man Bat is female. We learn that Kirk has been experimenting on his wife Francine against her will, injecting her with a steroid cocktail infused with bat DNA in an effort to cure her deafness. She doesn't want to be cured, but he doesn't give her a choice. Every night, he gives her a new serum that has the side effect of transforming her into a horrifying creature with no control over her actions, but a vivid memory of everything she did. Kirk is taken into custody, charged with all the murders at the hand of his monster, and Batman comforts Francine, a victim of severe ableism and abuse from her husband. Control over her body taken away from her, forced to live with the guilt of having killed all those people against her will. Because all of the greatest Batman villains, despite being ripped right out of a horror movie, when you break them down to their purest form, are just that, victims. Victims of their environment, their surroundings, their circumstances. They're still damaged people who use those circumstances as an excuse for violence and bloodshed, but still the core of their descent into madness is almost always fueled by pain, fear, and suffering. Horror from tragedy. And just like Batman exists to make sure that no child feels the same pain that Bruce Wayne felt all those years ago, he also exists to make sure that nobody endures the same suffering as Victor Freeze, Basil Carlo, Harvey Dent, Francine Langstrom, even Edward Nashton, the Joker, and all his other villains. The Batman exists to try and make sure nobody is a victim ever again. Again, it's really hard to take me seriously wearing this. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you liked this video, be sure to like button and subscribe. And also let me know down below of other villains that you would like me to do something similar for, because this was a lot of fun. I like doing smaller pitches like this. This was cool. Special thanks to Alto the Sting, Cabbage Boy, Cassidy Bond, Chick McDoofus, Connor Langell, Cosmic Tragedy, Iron Ninja, Jonah, Corey's Not Fresh, Lime Spice XL, Logan Triplet Films, Ryder Harrison, Simply Dan, The Artsy Fartsy Guy, Tim Newfeld, Troy Says By Erasure Is Gay, Tyler Goodrich, Yush Kapoor, Zachary Stonebreaker, Zero Hero 148, and ZZ Toasty for being spectacular fanboys on my Patreon. This is my Troy Boy 17 coming at you live. Remember that movies are art, regardless of what anyone will tell you. Be responsible, happy Spooktober, and I'll see you around.